thank you very much, Rock. Uh, that's very nice data and presentation. So in my presentation, I want to show you um, a couple of uh, channel validation data on the next generation of the uh, automated patch crime system, iFlux system. So the purpose of this uh, study was twofold. One is to support the SIPA has the high throughput screening uh, efforts uh, across different sites on different platforms, generate validation data. The second fold is that we want to test the feasibility of using iFlux um, HT system in screening of the voltage gated uh, ion channel compounds because we know that this platform is um, very good at the, the ligand gated ion channel uh, compound screening but we want to test the feasibility of whether we can use this for uh, voltage gated ion channels. But before I go into the details of the data, I want to spend a couple of slides to briefly introduce you what we do, who we are, and what we do. Uh, European Scientific is a global company, as actually a leading uh, CRO serving mostly three, mainly three uh, di different industries. The fit test, the bathroom pharmaceutical test, and environmental test. And we are leading, actually, number one service providers in most of the fields in these three different industries. And now we're getting into the diagnostic industry, too. Uh, we are established in 1987 as European Scientific. And now, as of the year of 2015, we have around 225 labs in 39 countries. Uh, we have roughly 23,000 full-time employee, and we have over, over 150,000 analytical methods available for the customer. The subsidiary or the business units that uh, the Einstein Services uh, team was in is actually European Pharma Discovery Services. And this business unit was created by the integration and um, acquisition of three different legacy companies. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2012, the, the Europeans acquired the Lexi Pan Labs. In 2013, uh, the Lexi Serp, and combined them into European Serp Pan Labs in 2013-2014. In the year of 2014, uh, the Europeans acquired the, the Lexi uh, Merck Millipore or EMD Millipore Discovery and Development Solution Business Unit, and take part of that and then um, integrate that into. Uh, the business units that we're in now, which is called Eurofence Pharma Discovery Services. And here shows the global footprint and the map of the, the Eurofence uh, Pharma Discovery Services. We have a site in St. Charles, Missouri, uh, which is the Ion Channel Service team is located in. And we have a site. Uh, at the site here, we also have the, uh, the uncle panel services, the, the immuno signaling services, and as well as the amitoxic services. And we have a site in uh, Dundee, Scotland, which uh, is a home for the, the kinase profiler services. And we have a, a site in the, uh, Poitiers, France, which is a legacy syrup site. It's a home for a lot of in vitro assays as well as some cellular assays there too. And we also have a site in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, which is a legacy pan lab site. Um, they specialize in a lot of vivo, in vivo pharmacology tests as well as some in vitro assay as well. So like I said, by com combination of all these different uh, legacy services units that make us a full service provider that can cover your needs from the very beginning of your tar target identification and validation until your compounds go goes into the, the clinical trials. Um, And I want to give you a brief introduction about CEPA before, before I go into the actual data. So late 1990s and early 2000s, we have a lot of compound withdrawal from the market due to the Trossard risk. And uh, the scientists in the pharmaceutical industry and academia actually figured out this is largely due to the, the herd blockage or herd inhibition. Um, in the uh, cardiac tissue. And uh, HERGO refers to a human interglobal related gene uh, channel. And then uh, the, ch the, the, the current is referred as IPR, and channel also refers as QB11.1. So we know that the blockage of HER can lead to a cardiac action potential duration prolongation and EADs, and which can lead to the QT prolongation and eventually a uh, pro-rhythmic risk or to start. So all these findings leads to 
the implementation of the ICH S7B and E14 guidelines early in the 2000s. And this herc centric strategy that we're using is very effective and somewhat successful because the evidences are since the implementation of these guidelines uh, from 2000, early 2000, there's no drugs actually removed from the market due to the torsoidal pruritismic risk. But the problem here is we have a HERC inhibition compound collection. We have a QT prolongation compound collection. This all represents a large collection of the compounds or the other uh, drug candidates. But the actual compounds that has the potential prorhythmic or torsart risk only represents a very small subset of these compound collections. So this leads to um, the strategy is not very specific and leads to a lot of unnecessary early compound attrition during our uh, drug discovery and de development process. So this leads to the CEPA paradigm or the CEPA initiative. So now we're looking to, there's multiple cardiac ion channels. We know that QG prolongation doesn't equal to prorhythmia risk or tosar risk. HERG inhibition doesn't equal to prorhythmia or tosar risk. The good evidence, is, or, uh, evidence or example is that Prozac or verapamil blocks HERG, but also inhibit the CAP1 to the L-type currents at roughly the same concentration, and they are cardiac safe. And then there's other examples of these compounds too. So the basic idea is that you have a fine balance of inhibition uh, between the inward currents and the out outward currents actually that cancels out the effects of each other. So um, our herb centric or herb only focus has a very negative impact on the drug development that, as I just told you. It caused unnecessary early compound attrition and caused a lot of um, potential of losing good drugs. So that, thus we have this new paradigm of cardiac safety eval evaluation, which we call CEPA, Comprehensive In Vitro Arrhythmia Assay, which basically contains uh, three different approaches. One is that we uh, test the effects of the test compounds on multiple cardiac ion channels, and then we feed all this data into a computerized in silico uh, model re reconstruction to predict the, the risk of a pre-arrhythmia pre or to start. And then we, we test the compounds in the uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes um, model to confirm this finding. Actually, the, another, another aspect of this is then we confirm the finding in the uh, early clinical trial data. So what's, what are the candidates for the current? So like, like I just told you, for the current candidate, we want to look, in, look into the cardiac ion channels that has a uh, that can balance out the outward current inhibition and inward current inhibition. So we have before we have herc centric herc centric strategy, which has the herc blockage, and now we're discussing about the possibility of a sodium fast current and sodium late current um, test in the L-type cap one two, and also the candidate. Uh, we also have QV long QG QV seven seven point one link channel and QR two one erective fire channel. But we are still in discussion about what, what's the final list of the channels that we're going to test and include into this cardiac uh, current candidates. For it, this particular study, I'm going to just show you a validation data on three different channels. Uh, the sodium-1,5, both the pick current and late current, uh, the HER channel, and uh, as well as the CAP-1,2 channel on the anaplugs. So I want to no mention that actually here at the European Ion Channel Service Team, we offer a monthly service that we test eight different cardiac ion channels on the Ivorx Quattro and many patch clamp to, to evaluate the, uh, the multi-channel effects on the cardiac ion, channel, uh, ion, ion channels. And we are currently also validating these currents or channels on multiple ion channel platforms, which include the ion flux platform I'm going to show you in just a little bit. Here I want to show you a brief, a little a video uh, introduce you the, the platform. So Ionflux HT platform was a plate-based microfluidic design that the plate was defined or divided into 32 different recording patterns. In each recording pattern, you can see that we have eight compound wells, two compound wells for internal solution, and one well for a cell. And then the plate was inserted into the uh, platform, and everything was controlled by the pressure. There's no moving parts. Uh, the compound, the cell addition, or the cell flow, 
the, the introduction of internal solutions and introduction of your test compounds are all controlled by the pressure to ensure the fast introduction and removal of all the components, particularly test compounds. So the cells are flowing by the, driven by the pressure, and then we apply a negative pressure on the trap, which are the top two panels that you can see on this video, and then to attract the cells into the traps. And then after that, after the seal was obtained, you can see that we can apply another bigger pressure to, to obtain uh, the, the uh, wholesale recording. And then you start uh, profusing GABA on the different recording traps. And you can see that the traces show you a dose-dependent response of the GABA. I've noticed that on the on your computer screen there might be a little bit lag on the uh, on the video, uh, which actually later on you're going to have the PDF version of the slide deck, and you can also uh, watch this video on the YouTube. So, like I just told you, the Hindflex HT system is a microfluidic plate-based design, so it gives you a lot of flexibility in the assay development and design. Uh, and as well as a very fast, super fast, actually, compound re re introduction and removal within 100 milliseconds. Also, temperature control, and as well as the um, individual cell trap recordings that you can test multiple targets on the same plate. First, we validated the, the HackHerc channel on the Influx HT. In this set of experiments, we, we look into different aspects of the experiment. First is the current stability. Uh, we test the time match vehicle control throughout the course time course of the recording to make sure that the, the current rundown is minimal because as you know, the current rundown might be a problem for your potency evaluation because the reduction of your signal even without introduction of the compound is a problem. Uh, you can't do a, a rundown correction whether it's linear or exponential, but sometimes we know that just by adding the compound it causes a unpredicted uh, drop of the current. So we want to make sure that our current recording is very stable across the, 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 the time period that we're applying the compound. And then we test a couple of reference compound pharmacology on the cells to make sure that they're, they agree with the historical data in-house and the published literature data. And then we test the intra-round variability on different days on the same reference compound to make sure that our assay is robust enough. And all this data was generated on the Eurofence Precision hack her cell lines. And we also did a cross-platform correlation, uh, compare the data collected from the ion flux to the Q-patch. On this slide, you can see we use a pretty standard uh, HERC voltage protocol. And the upper panel, you see the current stability, the current throughout the recording time period is pretty stable. I show you three representative lines. And on the bottom panel, you see the C surprise, the baseline recording is very stable, and then after that, you have a very nice um, stepwise, step, step like those dependent response of C surprise by adding higher and higher concentration of C surprise. And towards the end, you have a nice washout because the, the, the solution is a continuous perfusion, and solution exchange rates on this platform is really fast. And then we test a couple of reference compounds on the heart channel. We test Aspenazole, Cisopride, E4031, Cephenodine, and as well as the time edge vehicle control. And you can see that all the reference compounds, the potency data, is actually it's really close uh, to reported many patch plant data, and the vehicle control uh, shows minimal on that across the, uh, the, the time of period of the reporting. In the next set of experiments, we look into the intraday precision to test the robustness of the assay. We pick three compounds, Cisoprize, S-Pamazole, Tefanidine, as well as time edge vehicle control, and test those on two different days. You can see they, between day one and day two, the IC50 value is really close to each other, uh, show that our assay on the influx, the HERG assay on the influx is very uh, robust. 
Then we compare the potency value of the reference compound between Q-patch and Onslaught. You can see that they both agree with each other. And the time match vehicle control looks uh, very good with mean low rundown, current rundown. Next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some sodium 1.5 uh, data on the ion flux. Again, we look into the current stability with time match vehicle control. We look into some reference pharmacology of the reference compounds. And we also look into the late current pharmacology uh, induced by the ATX2 and blocked by ranolipin. And again, all the data was generated with the Eurofence precision that uh, cell line NAP15 in the hex background. In this slide, you can see I show you use a two-course protocol to test the state dependency uh, of the test compounds. Um, in Rock's presentation, here, he already explained that the state dependency of the blockage, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. But you can see, our, again, our vehicle control shows a very stable response across the time of the recording. And then you have a very nice step response of lidocaine as you apply higher concentration of lidocaine and then until fully blockage of top concentration. And then after that, you have a full reversal or washout of the lidocaine blockage effects and bring the current back down to the baseline level. And you can see that the lidocaine shows the post one IC50 of, of 737.9 close to one millimolar. And the second pulse shows IC50 of 82.7 shows a very uh, state dependent inhibition of lidocaine which also, again, this data agrees with the uh, literature values. Then we do the same thing across all the human NAV receptors we have in-house. Uh, we have NAV11 through 18. But here, the only difference is that we actually use a usage-dependent pro protocol. We use a 20 pulse protocol to test the usage or frequency dependency of the test compounds. Uh, we use either, either tetracaine, lidocaine, or uh, have a compound for the NAV18. So MAP11, you see there's a um, usage dependency between post 1 and post 2, a uh, post 20 for the potency data, and similar uh, findings on the MAP12. And uh, on the lower panel, you can see vehicle control, time match vehicle control of each uh, receptor or channel, and show you minimal uh, current rundown throughout the reporting. Here's the data for 1.3 and 1.4. Again, the, the potency value agree with the published literature value as well as our in-house data. 1.5 and 1.6 and 1.7 and 1.8. On that 1.8, I want to uh, draw your attention to this ABA compound. It's known to, it's very difficult to get the potency value down to low nanomolar range on the automated patch client platforms um, for this ABA compound on the NAP 1.8. Um, but in here, I showed you that actually due to the fast solution exchange and continuous perfusion feature of the ion flux, we can actually uh, get the, uh, the potency value down to the low nanomolar range. And here you see the vehicle control um, data. The, the baseline response is very stable across the time. So next couple of slides, I want to show you uh, MAP15 lake current recording. Uh, first, what we do is, again, uh, on the top panel, this is the baseline response, and then we add different concentrations of ATX2, and you can see there's a nice dose-dependent response. And then on the lower left panel, you see that's the vehicle control with um, little to no late currents. And then on the right panel, you see there's a dose-dependent response, ATX2-induced late current. And we compare the iFlux potency value to the Q-patch, and they are very close to each other. Um, and, and uh, as well as agree with the historical values and published publish later, literature values. And we also use the temperature control feature of the Anflux system, test the, the ATX2 compounds at 37 degree and room temperature, and we did see there's the potency shift between these two different temperatures. We have another cell line with beta-1 uh, auxiliary units, and we, we want to test that. So again, we do the same ex similar experiments, induce ATX2 to do a dose response, um, dose, dip, dose response, and you can see the, the baseline response. Again, it's very stable. And then if you introduce a different concentration of ATX2, it shows a very nice step-like uh, dose-dependent response. 
And again, here's the vehicle. Here's the um, those dependent induced lake currents by the ATX2. Uh, similar comparison, we do 37 degree on the ion flux room temperature and compare that with the Q patch. There's a shift between Q patch potency values and ion flux, but we don't see a temperature dependent shift on the potency of ATX2 on the MAP15 beta 1 cell line. And next, I want to show you that we can block this ATX2 induced uh, lake currents by Ramalo thing, which is a known lake current blocker. Um, again, you see here's the baseline response. And then we, we use ATX2 to induce the lake currents, and we use different concentrations of Ronaldozine to block it. You can see there's a nice dose dependent blockage of the lake currents with a washout reversal. And we compare the potency value again between the ion flux and the Q patch, and the potency value is really close across different platforms. In the next set of experiments, I want to show you some uh, preliminary, preliminary data we have on the CAP12 cell line. The CAP12 cell line was known a uh, technical challenge or difficult on the high throughput uh, automated patch plan, uh, platforms, mostly due to the current stability or current round down. Um, here I want to show you with the flux that we can get a very stable baseline response of the uh, time edge vehicle control. Uh, historically, well, the way we're dealing with the current round of CAP12 is actually on the Quattro, we use a perforated patch. And uh, Quattro is probably shows the, the, the best or, or with the minimal current round down compared to other true wholesale current recordings, such as uh, Patch Express, QPatch, or other wholesale uh, automated patch class, uh, systems. Actually, right now, when people are dealing with round down uh, problems of CAP12, um, um, even on the QPatch or Patch Express, or other wholesale patch clamp systems, so we actually also try perforated patch instead of uh, wholesale recording. Uh, but here, I want to show you some very exciting preliminary data actually on single hole recording modes, which is the upper panel, and population modes, which is the lower panel, and the superimposed uh, calcium currents over different time that they are pretty stable uh, throughout the reporting time period, which is about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, with mi minimal current around down. It, actually, this reporting was uh, achieved by uh, wholesale reporting. This is very exciting, and uh, we're continuing to test on pharmacology uh, of the reference pharmacology of CAP12. On this slide, I want to show you the capabilities of the Unchanneled Service Team here at Eurofence uh, Panlabs. We have a couple of menu patch clamp rig. We have a uh, Q-patch uh, system here. We have several Ironworks Quattro system as well as the Ironflux HT system I just showed you. We also have a high content image express system as well as the XGL Mastro system which we currently use for uh, kind of model size MEA recording. Uh, we also have a couple of plate readers for fluorescent signal readings and as well as uh, a lot of liquid handlers for lab, lab automation. With that, I want to thank you for your time and audience, and um, thank you very much. If you have questions, you, you can ask now. Thank you.